behind or lost and then found. All clues that form a rich and compelling story of who we are and what we did. I try to connect with all of our speakers before we gather here. When I reached out to Nigel to make a date, she wondered if we could speak earlier rather than later, as she said she was going to prison the next day. I'll let her explain. Please welcome Nigel Port. Hello. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about the collaborative work that I've been doing at San Quentin State Prison since 2011. I'm going to start with projects that are photographic and end by talking about the podcast I do called Ear Hustle, which is about everyday life inside prison. Um, I, I wanted to find a way to get into prisons because I was interested in what was happening inside of them. Um, but I didn't want to go in as a photographer or, in quotes, a tourist looking around. And I happened to find out about an opportunity through the Prison University Project, which is a nonprofit organization in San Francisco that offers an AA program to the men inside San Quentin. So I started going in as a volunteer professor, teaching the first ever history of photography class there. And although the class was about history and about learning the importance of the image, I wanted the men in the class to also get a feel for what it was like to create and to insert their own creativity into an image. So one of the exercises we came up with was this idea of mapping a photograph, of looking at it, dissecting what's there, and figuring out how to insert your own narrative into the piece. And one of the things that I really love about photography is that it's this generous medium that allows all of us to become part of what we're looking at. Um, it also rewards looking at detail. And I feel like we can understand complex situations, we can understand other people if we understand the details of their life and what they're interested in. And for me, photography really stands in as something that can do that. Um, have, oh, clicker, okay. So this is one of the images we used. Um, this is a photograph by Eggleston. And um, what I did was to print the image on two sides of one paper, 11 by 17 inches, and give different photographs to the men in the class. And they were allowed to take the images back to their housing unit, live with it for a couple of weeks, map one side of it, and then use their mappings to create a narrative about what they saw in the photograph. Um, I told the, the guys who the artists were, but really nothing about the photograph. The idea was really for them to investigate it themselves. So this is an example of the mapping. Um, and I like the details that he notes. The thing that really stands out for me with Marvin's dissection is the top, where he circles the door and writes an arrow that says, figure this out as if he himself is trying to figure a way to get out of the photograph, or maybe by extension, how to get out of prison. Um, I talked about how I think photography is a generous medium that allows us to insert ourselves into the image. And the narrative that Marvin wrote about this photograph was based on his insistence that no matter what I said, this photograph was taken in South Central LA while he grew up. And he creates on the bottom, you can see this complicated kind of family tree about all the people he knew in South Central and what would happen um, kind of during their, their daily excursions. So again, he takes a photograph that has nothing to do with his particular existence and finds it a way to make it about something that he can understand. Another example of that is a photograph by Stephen Shore. Um, this was done by John. And I love, I really do love all the details that he figures out here. He didn't know the date of the photograph, but because he spent so much time looking at it, he discovered the marquee of the movie theater and the movie, um, uh, what's it called, Night Moves is playing. And he remembers that that came out in 1975. And through that, he's able to date the photograph. He also talks about a sign that you can see on the right of the photograph that says discounts. And he, he sees how that's a newer sign. And from that, he realizes that this is a neighborhood that used to be wealthy that has now fallen on hard times. And the narrative that he creates based on this photograph is one about a man, the character in the center, who's leaving prison and going back to a home that he just doesn't recognize anymore.
One of the things that's interesting in prison is that there are no computers. So most people are writing by hand. And that's something I just don't see anymore. So I also like looking just at the beauty of the handwriting and the way that it's um, interacting with the paper. Um, this is a photograph that I'm sure many of you know by Joel Sternfeld. And if you don't know the story behind it, it looks like um, there's you know, a, an intentional fire and the firefighter is just ignoring the picture. Um, but if you know more about the picture, you know that it's a controlled burn. And it brings up something that Debbie mentioned um, this morning during her talk and something I think about a lot with photography or with any um, creative endeavor. And that is that you can start with fact or fiction, but inevitably one recalls the other. And if that's not used in a political circumstance, I actually I do find it disturbing when it's used in the political world. But when it's used in the art world, I think it's really fascinating because it talks about how we're always struggling to come to terms with our existence, which is fact and fiction mingled together. Um, so I just point that out because this photograph is really about fact and fiction. So um, Joseph, who is looking at this picture, obviously notes the fire and his narrative um, is written from the perspective of somebody who owns the farm. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear you laugh, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So, but first, he writes about the perspective of loss and how his childhood place is going to be going away. But what will never go away is this recipe for a special pie, Mrs. McLean's pie. Um, and when I tell people that I work in prison, people kind of expect that everything I'm going to have to say about it is dour and upsetting and depressing. And indeed, there is plenty of that inside of prison. But there's also a lot of humor and lightheartedness and love. And that kind of thing comes across in that really kind of sweet recipe for pie. While I was teaching, I did that for three semesters, um, I was given access to an amazing archive of photographic negatives taken at San Quentin State Prison between 1938 and about 1984. They were all taken by correctional officers as a way to document invent, uh, events inside the prison. There's tens of thousands of negatives, and they were just kind of moldering away in a storage facility. Nobody was seemingly taking care of them. And I was really fortunate to be given access to them. So since about 2012, I've been going through them, organizing them, scanning them, and trying to make sense of them. It's interesting to me that the correctional officers were using four by five cameras up until the 80s. I mean, that does tell you that change happens very slowly inside of a prison. But because of that, the negatives are gorgeous. And they make beautiful prints, although as I said, they document everything inside the prison from murders to suicides, you know, to really very painful things to look at, to weddings and parties and people at jobs, kind of all the things that happen outside happen inside with the added element of violence. Um, so the, the negatives were not organized. Some of them are in these um, envelopes, and there's a date and a brief description, but a lot of them are open to interpretation. So the first part of just working this, with this was just trying to make kind of categories of what I would find. And there were images that clearly reference life in prison, like this escape dummy that somebody had made. Um, one of the, uh, kind of on a side note, one of the things you learn when you spend a lot of time in prison is that there's incredible creativity inside because there are a lack of resources. People have to figure out in many ways how to take care of themselves. So although I don't know how this escape dummy was made, somehow it was molded um, with found material and then obviously using real hair to create <laughs> the eyebrows and the hair. Um, this is an image of a suicide. This, this place in San Quentin is called Suicide Alley. Um, I'm sorry, the next image is, is pretty gruesome, just to give you a heads up. Um, there's images of traumas, large and small. And you really have to wonder, you know, why would someone even take a photograph of a single Band-Aid? And then there's also really beautiful images that don't reference prison at all. You'd have no idea you were there. So this is from a family visit. This is called Mother's Day. Um, you can probably guess from the clothes, it's the 70s. 
1976. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this one's called um, Two Inmates and a Seal. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes the titling is, inc is incredibly obvious, but I also kind of, I find kind of funny. Um, so as I said, I was going through the negatives, trying to organize them. And on their own, I, I think they're incredibly interesting to look at. But I also felt like there was a key component missing, and that was figuring out how to collaborate with the men inside to bring this archive to life in a different way. Um, as I mean, I still I call myself an outsider. I've been working in a prison since 2011, but I've never been incarcerated. So when I look at them, I bring my experience as a free person to what I see there. But when the men inside look at them, they're able to interpret them and escort us around the image and show us things that we may or may have not seen, things that we miss, and ways that we can then see the photograph in, in a new light. So I used the same principle that I did with the photographs by well-known men, which was to, uh, excuse me, well-known photographers, which was to invite men to become part of a photography group where I brought images in from the archive. We sat and talked about them, and then they were able to bring images back to their housing unit to map and to write about. So this is a picture of Kevin, who was part of the project. This is in the housing unit, North Block. And I want to show you just a couple examples of those. So here's an image um, without any writing, without any intervention on it, um, called Stabbing in the Gym. And then here's the interpretation done by Ruben Ramirez, who was one of my students and also uh, worked on this project. And I, I just, I love how he writes about the picture. And after reading his words, I can never look at this image in the same way. It's no longer this cold, clinical image of someone who's been stabbed. It's an image about striving. It's an image about dualities. And it's an image about experience. And he writes across the body, which I think is also really beautiful. The arms symbolize buttresses attempting to prevent the fallen, attempting to prevent the structural failure of a once proud cathedral. Encouragement and, and enlightenment versus indifference and authoritative tyranny. And to, to have someone look at an image of brutality and to be able to see it in these architectural terms was really stunning to me. I mean, it's, it's poetic, it's alluring, but it doesn't deny the brutality either of the image. And, the, and the, Ruben is someone who didn't have a lot of education before he came to prison. He ended up getting his AA degree in college, uh, in the college program. But he was so profoundly moved by the image and found this personal and kind of enlightening way to talk about something. Um, I'm, I'm interested, obviously, in issues of prison reform and how we can change prisons. And I, I don't believe that people are interested in that through numbers and statistics. I think we make change through stories and through uh, personal communication. And that's really you know, what this project is about. Here's another example. Of, of a photograph that was written on. This was at a family visit. And it's kind of an amusing image because there's this man in the front luxuriating in this woman's lap. And he can't see that behind him is another man with his hands on this woman's shoulders. And so you don't know exactly what's happening here. And Shah, who mapped this very, very smartly at the bottom, just said, this is a picture of free love, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. And then the final example um, was an image that was mapped by Shakur. And what appears to be a fight being photographed is, again, this commingling of fact and fiction. Um, because as you look at it, you notice that there's a man in the bottom corner looking up at the photographer. And obviously, if there was a fight going on, this couldn't be happening. So what Shakur figured out was that this was a reenactment that correctional officers were photographing as evidence of what, a, what an altercation could look like. So working on all with these photographic projects and thinking about stories um, encouraged me to work on a very different kind of storytelling project inside the prison, which is the podcast um, Ear Hustle, 
which I started um, with Erlon Woods and Antoine Williams, both pictured here, who at the time were incarcerated at San Quentin. And our idea was to tell the everyday stories of life inside prison told from the perspective of those who live it. Originally, the idea was to air it only inside prisons, um, but while we were working on it, we entered a contest through Radiotopia and were lucky enough to win this contest. And the podcast ended up being aired outside the prison. Um, and we're now in our, uh, starting our fifth season. When we started the podcast, I knew nothing about audio. Neither did Erlon or Antoine or the other men we worked with. So we really had to learn everything together as a group. And I think that's a really wonderful way to start a collaboration when everyone starts at the same place. So I want to play a small clip from the podcast. This is from an episode called Looking Out, which is about this guy Roach who loves animals and takes care of all kinds of critters inside prison. And so that for me, the, the topic of the podcast, this episode is really about finding love and giving love inside a place where it's really hard to do that. And for me, the podcast is very similar to the way I look at photography, which is it's about details, it's about observation, and it's about the quiet, small things. Um, this, this clip also really highlights the way the podcast works. Erlon and I are the hosts that bring you in and out of the story. Um, there's varied emotions within the podcast, and it has rich sound design, which is all done by Antoine Williams. OK, so here's the clip. So how would you describe him? To me, I think Roach looked like the original Jesus Christ. You know, <laughs> I mean, he got the dreadlocks. Uh, he looked like he's from the earth. And if he could, he'd probably just be wearing a leaf. And he got this one little thing that he do. He'll just start sniffing on his dreadlocks. I know I've seen him do that. He grabs his hair and he pulls it in front of his nose and just sniffs. Why are you whispering? Because I feel like I'm talking about him behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> he knows he does it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not but, like he's going to no, hear this and he, go, oh my God, no. I sniff my hair. Hey, he'll catch himself. You just be looking at him, he like, oh. <laughs> FYI, I do smell my dreads. I put different oil on each one of them. They smell good. They smell like I just came out the dirt, hanging out with roots and stuff. But you know what, though? When people from the outside look at Roach, they be like, oh, dude, weird, man. I ain't talking to dude. But Roach is a cool dude. My name is Renell Draper, but I go by Roach. My relationship with people is pretty strained. I don't trust them. From early on, they, they have been a source of pain for me. So Roach is about 40 years old, and he's a pretty shy guy. Until you know him. When I was a child, before I was removed from the care of my mom's custody, she tried to drown me a couple times in the tub. And then she stopped and she left the bathroom and she was crying. I, I knew she was unhappy or sad at something I did. I wanted to actually comfort her, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I don't remember her face and I haven't seen her since. So again, that's a really good example of what the podcasts sound like, um, going from things that will make you laugh to things that are arresting and, and quite upsetting. Um, I've heard this clip so many times, and every time I hear the end where he says, I don't remember my mother's face, um, it's such an intense thing to say. It's not saying I don't remember her, but I don't remember her face, and that's such a profound loss. Um, I want to end on a, on a little bit of a happier note, though. Um, people ask me a lot how do you define success and how do you know when a project works and for me a project is successful when it inspires other people to do their own work and do their own storytelling and this is a picture of Ruben Ramirez who did this incredible piece and he I think he's watching the live feed so hi Ruben um, he's very shy though so <laughs> anyway um, after we worked on the project together and through talking through photo about photography he told me that he could now see fascination everywhere and isn't that a great way to think about life, that we can see fascin fascination everywhere, no matter where we are? Um, the, other th the other thing I love is that when work you do inspires other people to not just think, but to get creative themselves. And it doesn't matter what the medium is. It's the idea that it's created the impulse to make and to share. And so I just wanted to share these three amazing things that Ear Hustle listeners have done. So whether it's creating a, a blanket through knitting, 
or a digital drawing or incredible nail art. It all represents the impulse that we have, which is to be creative and to tell stories and hopefully connect in a world that can feel very distant and cold. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and hope that you all feel the spirit to create.